So one of the things we really uh, want to talk about is how you lead with love. And one of the critical elements that we want to talk about and why we're going to do an exercise is it's great for us to come together and everybody is here by what? By choice today, right? Anybody forced to come here by their company? Oh, that's actually true. Um, so we have one person who was forced to get here. But one of the things that is, is really interesting to us is that most of the time, you can't go back to your organization unless it's a really evolved organization and just start talking about love. Leaders focus on the big picture. They focus on strategy. They focus on out there and understanding. And that's where this concept of something like love can come to play. And they really want to move organizations forward through performance. But what employees care about and care about deeply is how they're treated and how they're treated every day. The definition that we like to use for culture is it's the way we do things around here. Culture was mentioned uh, about 35 times already today in different presentations. So we all know that it's out there. It seems kind of ambiguous and how do you get your arms around it? But it's not that complicated if you consciously stop and take a pause and actually look at what culture does. Um, culture and truth are you know, genuinely tightly created, and love and truth, as we know, are closely created. So one of the greatest things that we really, really want to make sure we transfer today is that cultures um, are not conducive to, they are very, <laughs> our current culture is not conducive to respectful truth-telling. We tell a lot of little white lies. We avoid a lot of truth because it would hurt somebody's feelings. And we avoid a lot of truth because we're personally afraid of what it will mean when that person has a reaction to the truth we tell them. So what, is, what can we do about that? What is important to do? One of the things that we talk about is kind is different than good. You can be kind to somebody, perhaps, by avoiding a truth with them and not telling them what they need to be successful. But if you want to be good for that person and good with that person, you actually have to tell them the truth. Speaking the truth is therefore seen as mean in cultures that don't get it, but we think of it as the most loving thing that you can do. There's a book I read a few years ago called Radical Honesty, and it had some pretty radical ideas in there, and um, my husband kind of freaked out because <laughs> I was like, no, we can't be that honest. And I'm like, I think we can, let's just test it. And that's one of the primary things in there is that if you really love someone, you will always and forever be telling them the truth. What we really believe is that, that you have to create safety in order for that to happen and that there is intentionality in that and a specific space and way to do that. So safety equals trust equals truth. If someone is safe to say what they need to say to you, you can build trust in that and then you can get at the truth. And we're gonna spend, that's the exercise we're gonna do here together in this cauldron. We like to hold, we like to talk about the work that we do as we kind of create a big bowl where great things can happen. And we hold the space in that bowl for people to be successful together. We've already done that, and this is a bowl-shaped space, so that's kind of cool. We've done that because we opted in, and we've had a lot of great conversations. But we're gonna show you and demonstrate with you a way of doing that and doing that pretty quickly with a group that might not have as much natural native trust with you, or even if you think they do, just to make sure that they're going to be able to say all the truth they need to say. Um, intentional safety is what we're all about. Intentionality and culture. Um, I think Sam said, you have a culture by design or default. What we tell everybody is you have a culture, whether you can put your finger on it or not, um, whether it is the jester or whether it's some other archetype, you kind of can frame it in that archetype, but there's depth to that. There's things underneath that. And if you have not paid attention to the design of your culture, you might not be getting out of it what you want. And one of the things we know is that there's deep connection between high-performing cultures and high-performance, period, and organizations that are really getting done what they want to get done and doing that in a loving way. So we're going to create a community here, and I'm going to hand this off to Leb. I think this is the handoff slide. Yes. Um, and let Leb um, tell you a little couple stories. Okay, so we can't, we can't do what we really want to do today without you, all right? And I just really want you to know that. Um, we're going to do, I'm going to read you a couple of stories, and, and I'm going to start right now by asking you to close your eyes, so some people have already done that. And... <laughs> <laughs> And I'm also going to hope that the ice cream doesn't kick in and we lose you. Um, so here we go. Imagine you are in Russia. So I also want to honor our Russian volunteers. She was awesome. Imagine you are in Russia. 
It's 1988. Russia is still a communist country, and Mikhail Gorbachev is in power. You've come to Russia with a running club called World Runners. There are 250 of us from 42 states. We are trained as citizen diplomats. We have learned Russian phrases. Our mission is to build relationships between the Soviet and American people. We are also raising money for hunger relief. We are there to run a communist showcase event, the Moscow International Peace Marathon. People will be there from all over the world. As a sports club, we are treated as competitive athletes. Most of us are well-trained joggers with big hearts. One night, we are taken to the Soviet circus. We had by then gotten used to being watched and followed everywhere we went. The circus was a grand event, something the communist government was very proud of. The last act was a high wire act, a very high, high wire act. The spotlight went from the circus floor to the top, where two artists were to walk a tightrope from one stand to another. When the spotlight reached the top, people at the circus gasped. Then the spotlight dropped to the floor. In everyone's view, a crew ran out and dismantled and removed the safety net. Again, People gasped. While people were gasping, I walked out. I had no desire to witness a possible fatal fall. Okay, let's open our eyes. So I want to ask a question, just shout it out. This, this bowl is small enough, I think we can hear each other. Why do you think we're telling you this story? And the hint is in the title of our talk. Come on, any ideas? No, no wrong answer. Yeah, you'll take a risk if the safety net is there, right? And you won't take that risk if the safety net's not there. Now, how does that relate to teams and communication, organizations and culture? Yes. Right, so if we're talking about promoting safety, to build trust, to get to the truth, which can promote speed, great results, community, love, what we're experiencing out in the field working with organizations and teams is a lot of times that safety is not intentionally built just like cultures are often by default. So what we're going to do here together today is we're going to build a safety net together. And I want to tell you a story. I'm going to ask for one more closed eyes exercise. But I want to tell you a story about this actually happened um, in New York City working with the Department of, of uh, Subways. And here we go. So close your eyes. Imagine you're in the room on this team. Okay? You're on a team that leads an important operational function for the New York City Transit Department of Subways. You're all leaders in your own right and one of the top 185 civil servants leading a department of 28,000 employees. You're responsible for moving six million people every day. As a team, we had built our safety net for effective communication. We were now working on trust. As we went around the table with each person talking about trust, its role in high performance, its role in building community, its role in promoting 
vulnerability and what was our personal approach to trust. We got to the last person at the table and he says, trust, you don't want to talk to me about trust. He went on to say that if you disagree with me in front of any one of our vice presidents, you embarrass any one of my staff in a meeting, you don't believe something, you don't deliver something you've promised, you're dead to me. And it's no different in my family. Now imagine, as I've asked, that you're on this team, the safety net's in place, and you've just heard this. Okay? So I'd like you to turn to somebody that's next to you or close to you and just share with them what would you be thinking and what might you say? What was on your mind? Yes. Okay, not afraid to be embarrassed. What else? What do you think people were thinking? Oh, yes. Yeah. So they're... they're he said that he's, this has actually happened before, and he, he tried for eight years to raise the truth and bring his, at times, maybe divergent opinion up, and then he gave up, and it, and it started to lose energy. And, and now I'm thinking of, you know, of heart math, and you start thinking of, well, what if that's the environment of the team that I work on or the organization that I live in, and is there anything that can be done about it? So let me just tell you what happened with this team. I think the oh shit moment in the room was that they all looked at each other and said, what if I'm dead to him? Right? Have I ever not delivered something that he considered important? And I might not even know it. I might no longer be alive and I don't necessarily even know it. Have I ever disagreed with one of his staff meters, uh, members in a meeting? Oh shit, I might be dead. You know, have I ever pointed something out that he didn't agree with in front of vice presidents or superiors? So they all were dead silent. The first response to his, you're dead to me, was total silence. The beautiful thing that happened, and I have to attribute this to the safety net, is someone said, Tony, I really care about you. <clears throat> it's emotional if you actually were there. He said, I really care about you, and what you've just said is unacceptable. I just can't, I can't accept it. And that kind of was the first fall into the safety net, and it wasn't fatal, because Tony didn't explode. And then someone else said, Tony, I really respect you. I didn't know any of this, but it seems really severe. And I don't think it's good for our team. We've got to do something about this. And they said, we've got to do something about this. And I swear, there are about 12, 14 people on that team. It went around the table like that. And the, f the fact that they framed it with love first caring first, some sense of compassion first. He just sat in it. And we ended the day, and he had heard, and what their basic final request was, will you reflect on this? And when we come back in tomorrow, will you comment? Will you share with us what you've been thinking about? And Tony came in the next day, um, you know, it was bated breath. And he said, I'd like to start the meeting off and let you know that you're right. He shared. So, it was still Tony. It was still kind of rough, you know, but he shared so beautifully that he had thought about it. And that he, no one had ever given him that feedback before. He'd always gotten away with it. And that's not love. 
So when Gene was talking about the power of willing, being willing to tell the truth, you know, what we want to add to the story besides safety is sometimes it takes some courage. But if we're going to live this out, this love and business movement, uh, to me it was a demonstration of some of what it's really going to take. It's, and it's more likely to happen if a safety net's in place. So it's a, it's a set of ground rules. So what we want to do right now is actually imagine this. this. All the people that are here right now, you're a team. And you are the team to bring this movement forward. And decide on what that first big step is going to be. And here's the question we want to ask you. We're going to put some of these up so you get a sense of what's in a safety net. The question to you is, what do you need? So not what do you think in general terms. What do you need? Feel that you can safely and responsibly, respectfully say anything at all. What would you need in place? I'll give you one example. I think it's up here. An example is a clear understanding of confidentiality. Right? Okay, no judgment. Yes, so some form of that comes up almost every time. I want to know that there aren't, I'm not going to be, there's going to be no retribution. I'm not going to be held with consequences for bringing up my truth. What else would you need? Look for yourself. Yeah, okay, compassion for mothers while you're learning how to communicate in a healthy way. Right, yes. Yeah, okay. So learning and, and extending trust in yourself. Yes. Yeah, the kind of commitment that says, regardless of what I say, the team's going to stand by my side. They're going to stay with me. Right, right. And then stay out of judgment. Because what you're going to see is they start to play with each other. Right? Yes. Right. Okay. Yeah, and it, it could be about the other people and it could be about what we're up to. Right? That are, if the purpose is large enough, I'm more likely to either not take the risk if there's no safety net or take it if there is one. Yes. Right. That's awesome. Okay. Yeah. I'm sorry. Recipro reciprocation that I'm not the only one and that other people are going to respond truthfully and it becomes kind of the DNA or a part of our team or it, what you might also think is it's a strength in our safety net. It's not just one person who's always stepping out. Yes. Oh, thank you for bringing that up. Yeah, that can actually be one of the reasons why people uh, don't speak up or won't speak the truth is they're uncertain about language, having a language barrier. And maybe we haven't, we haven't discussed how to handle that as a team, right? So therefore you feel either embarrassed or in some way, shape, uh, or form unsafe. In order to allow everyone's point of view to be valid, the other thing that often comes up is something about listening, right? You have to be, maybe open your heart as well as your ears to listen to some of the things that may bother you or be the voice in the wilderness crying a different tune or whatever the case may be. Yes. Shared intent uh, um, as a ground rule, um, it, it, it could you know, definitely work. It's usually covered more in common purpose and like why are we, why are we a team? Um, but questioning intent could also be that it's okay to question intent could also wind up on a safety net and, and in a safety net. Let me give you an example of something that happened in our consulting firm. So we had a, we had a partner in our firm who was petite. She was, I don't know, 5'2", five 5'3". Five and at some point, and this, I'm, I'm going back 20 years, but uh, we invited in... It wasn't Jean. <laughs> But you are beautiful. 
uh, we invited in a formal, uh, a former uh, military person who was who had his career took him to a very high level. He was actually the person who would hit the button if he got a call from the president to launch a missile. And he was about six four, and he had a deep, commanding voice. And he came into the firm. He's a great person, but he came into the firm, and in our initial meetings with each other, uh, what he did, which is probably what they did in their culture, is he would stand up when he wanted to make a point or get his point across, and he would raise his voice, this big, deeping voice, you know, this really deep voice, and he would pound his fist on the table. And that was kind of normal for him. And, she, she, you know, we had, <laughs> we had a hole in the safety net. Okay. Thanks, Samantha. So we had to create a rule around use of voice and body language because it shut her down. And she felt comfortable enough to say, that just shuts me down. I, I can't even think when that's happening. And I certainly can't get my best ideas or my love for him out. And I'm not experiencing his love for me unless we handle this. And we did. Okay? So it can be as unique as that. It can be about confidentiality. It can be about reprisal. It can be about, you know, some of the things that you might expect. But again, we're not going to take any more now, but I would ask you to look. You know what stops you when your heart starts to beat faster and you say, I really like to say it, but I, and I, and the only thing that's going to get it out in our experience is, say, is promoting safety intentionally, which leads to building trust, which leads to willingness to tell the truth, which leads to speed, agility, love, better results, and community. And the last thing I'd like to say is Tony took it home, too. So... I think sometimes we separate and think that, you know, we have a personal life and a professional life. Tony was Tony. And uh, later on, some members of his family called and said, what happened? <laughs> and it was a good call. Thank you.